I, as I literally said, I don't like Tony Isikos. I genuinely blame. I think he might be the godfather of a lot of the race problems that we have today. I don't. That's not an exaggeration in terms of his that essay, the case for reparations, single handedly radicalized every white girl on a college campus who eventually ended up working at the New York Times, behest of the BLM movement of all this other nonsense that we have today. So, but I I don't know to be so like calm a villain and evil and like Crystal, causing every racial essay, problem in America is crazy. That essay was the godfather <laughs> of an, the anti-racist movement. I mean, he's, uh, a, he's allowed uh, look, to he have a perspective and write what he wants. That doesn't make him a villain. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And to acknowledge yeah. that like, you know, racism in America and that this continues to be a legacy that matters today, there's not, like, that's a noble thing to do. So the fact he comes to a different that's conclusion then you are, uh, of course it's noble. No. I don't know, you're villainizing him in a way that's not that different from the way uh, Tony DeCoppo no, is I, I here on say, CBS. I would say to his face, and I also wouldn't call him an extremist, I would say I think your case for reparations would basically was the reason that we have all this DEI bullshit and that you effectively radicalized a bunch of white liberals into thinking that racism is the single biggest so problem in American life. So you would blame Ta-Nehisi Coates yeah, oh, absolutely, over, yes. okay, the yeah. police that murdered George Floyd over Donald Trump and all of his many provocations. I mean, I just think that to like lay the blame at the feet of one person is sort Tony of insane. Co- We've got a very spicy segment. You know, before I was even really into BreadTube, Gavin, before I was really even into this whole nebulous, I was still kind of stuck in business world, right? I was trying to do like ethical capitalism and, you know, I was trying to like make my way through everything. And I was working for a venture capital that only invested in local businesses. And, you know, I was doing you know, apps to feed the community and shit like that. You know, all of the, uh, you know, whatever stuff you do in college. But one of the things that helped really facilitate my radicalization process, I'd always been a Bernie bro, but I'd not been like radicalized, right? But I started reading ta Coates. I read all of his Atlantic pieces. I read We Were Eight Years in Power. I read Between the World and Me. I read, you know, uh, obviously the case for reparations and all of that. You know what I mean? And he really did open my mind up and while you could definitely criticize the guy in a way that I think Cornell West did a very good job of doing back in the day, that's why Ta-Nehisi Coates quit Twitter way back when. If you guys didn't follow that, it was a you know he was very fawning of Barack Obama for what he represented for uh, him as a black man, but he did not criticize of Barack Obama for his crimes against you know uh, black individuals abroad in a way that Cornell West mm-hmm. thought was sufficient and I kind of agree with. But anyway, yeah. long story short, it's been following Ta-Nehisi Coates' career a long time. His writing has meant a lot to me. It's beautiful. If you say whatever you will about his politics, he's an absolutely brilliant p- prosist and a genius guy. Um, but yeah, what did you uh, have to add before we plow into this spicy debate, Gavin? I mean, I, I kind of agree with your assessment. It's not that I agree with everything Ta-Nehisi Coates has ever written for or stood for. Obviously not. I think that Cornell West was right to, you know, criticize him back in the Obama era for his refusal to attack capitalism and identify that as an oppressive force, uh, yada, 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 right? But I think that with his most recent phase in this new book he has, which is partially about the Palestinian struggle, I think in a, in a sense he's really redeemed any of those kind of criticisms from that era and he's come back in a in a way like i said a fully redeemed man someone who's not just the establishment approved uh truth teller on the subject matter of race but someone who's actually willing to uh speak out against the establishment and say what they don't necessarily want him to say um which is very interesting because i I think it's fair to say for a while he was sort of like the approved you know uh, New Yorker, a uh, liberal establishment elite approved like soothsayer or whatever on the issue of race. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, Either way, uh, this was a very interesting debate. And yeah, I was taken aback by Sagar's tone when it comes to Don Hussey Coast. Like, I understand disagreeing with the guy, but I don't think I've ever seen someone with quite this much vitriol for him which is very weird. So that's basically the first question out of the gate. Yeah, and by the way, I said NBC is CBS. Yes. Um, but yeah, basically accusing him of being a terrorist effectively. And the framing of the question to me is incredibly significant because it gives up the game that if he didn't have this elite insider status that he can now trade on and effectively burn because that's what he's doing right now. All the political capital he b- built up in this world, he's now burning through at a uh, lightning pace because of what he says in the message. Like, he doesn't even get that interview if he's not ta mm-hmm. Coates, if he hasn't won those awards, if he doesn't have that elite status. And that's part of what 
his book doesn't say, you know, it's, he's an excellent writer. It's well-written. It's, you know, extraordinarily provocative in terms, not provocative, but evocative in terms of taking you into the life of a Palestinian, you know, living in Israel or living in the occupied territories. So it's important, but it's not really new ground. What makes it incredibly important is because of who he is and the fact that he's allowed into these rooms. So that was the opening question out of the gate. I have another clip that I'm gonna show you, which is basically the rest of the interview. Uh, also, these formats of like five minute interviews are so absurd. Ridiculous. But I wanna get your reaction to that before we move I on. I just to thought the it was piece. wild. That's a wild thing to say. I, as I literally said, I don't like Ta Nehisi Coates. I genuinely blame, I think he might be the godfather of a lot of the race problems that we have today. I don't, that's not. That is an insane thing to say. Let like that was the first thing where I was like, we have to really understand that he meant that, and he somehow has convinced himself. Imagine saying the Godfather of the race issues we have today is a black man advocating for racial equity. Are you kidding me, dog? Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, and. Like I'm not as familiar with Tanahasi Coates' writing as you are, Zach. I haven't read all of his books, like you said you have. But like he's not one of these "I hate white people" no. kind of like. And I know that's a you know very he's uh, not no one JPEG mafia. <laughs> <laughs> but like you know, there's that whole. There, I do think there's a what Sagar's referencing is the whole like white fragility genre of book where it's like you know let, let's profit off of white guilt and and write a handbook about how you can be less racist or what you know those kind of like and it is kind of a grift you know there's like high level you know academic yeah, the robin people d'angelo's yeah the robin d'angelo's all that kind of stuff i think another guy who kind of falls into that is the uh ibram x kindy you know anti, i haven't read that guy anti-racist baby remember that the oh, right wingers love that? yeah the oh. right wingers love to bring up that guy but again at least for somewhat good reason he is kind of cringy i don't view ta-nehisi coates as even being part of that no genre or that conversation like even if you disagree with his writings on race I, I just don't think he's part of that sort of like race grifter industrial complex it, it, you can write about race in america without being a grifter you can talk about these things without just profiting on white guilt or whatever i don't think that's what ta Coates coast was doing no between the world and me is without a doubt one of the most moving books i've ever read in my entire life guys i mean it will punch you in the stomach and that's me a white guy from you know kansas city and it is very moving and it is very powerful prose anybody that loves great writing has to love that book i'm sorry like i don't i don't know i just i you can't walk away from that and be like this guy's a grifter it is so personal it is so moving it is so raw and open and to disparage him in that way is ridiculous it is ludicrous it's beyond the pale i'm angry an exaggeration in terms of his that essay the case for reparations single-handedly radicalized every white girl oh as if that's a bad thing dude you that essay is amazing it's well argued it's thoughtful it ties it for people who don't know if you haven't read it Tanahasi coach expertly ties it to the housing crisis right and he talks about how this is how black people were robbed of their homes this is how black people were you know robbed of their ability to gain equity in their homes as a result of racism it's not just some like give us money tantrum piece that Sagar's about to try and convince you it is on a college campus who eventually ended up working at the new york times behest of the blm movement of all this other nonsense that we have just today. a bunch so of buzzwords I, again, for his I, idiots I really Audience. find him a villain in american politics oh my god that, that says said, so much I would, about you i don't even like him and i would not open with a question like that because that's wild uh it would be an interrogation of the book itself and not to say something like that would belong what did he say in an extremist the backpack, backpack of an extremist that's an insane thing to say uh and especially hmm. considering that that guy didn't disclose a lot of his own biases whenever it comes to israel so that's another problem i think that uh was going into that what you want to listen to the rest of it yeah, yeah. i mean i just want to respond a little bit to no, like sure. Go on. Yeah, i mean I, he's i disagree with his him, with Crystal. the race pessimist view but I, I don't know, to be so like calm a villain and evil and like Crystal, causing every racial essay, problem in America is crazy. That essay was the godfather <laughs> of an, the anti-racist movement. I mean, he's, uh, a, he's allowed oh, yeah. to he have a write perspective and write what he wants. That doesn't know. make him a villain. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And to yes. acknowledge yeah. the like, you know,
Again, what, I, I like how it doesn't even articulate what the issue is with the anti-racist movement. Because on its face, I mean, anti-racism, you have a problem with that? Do you want there to be, are you on the pro-racist side of things? Like, what is wrong with anti-racism? I don't, maybe it sounds cringy or something, but like, if you just objectively think about it, yeah, that's kind of a good thing. Yeah, Being based. anti-racist, isn't that what we all should be striving for? <laughs> Doesn't that make you like a badass if you're the chieftain of the anti-racist movement? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Racism in America and that this continues to be a legacy that matters today there's not like that's a noble thing to do. So the fact he comes to a different that's conclusion than you or I, of course it's noble no. that he comes to a different conclusion than you or I. I don't know. You're villainizing him in a way that's not that different from the way uh, Tony DeCoppola no, is here say, on CBS. I would say it to his face, and I also wouldn't call him an extremist. I would say I think your case for reparations would basically was the reason that we have all this DEI bullshit, and that you effectively radicalized a bunch of white liberals into thinking that racism is the single biggest so problem in American life. So you would blame Ta-Nehisi Coates? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, over, yes. okay, the yeah. police that murdered George Floyd, over Donald Trump and- Sagar loves the police that murder George Floyd. He also loves all the ones that kick your head in when you try and, you know, congregate as a group and demonstrate and exercise your First Amendment. He loves your First Amendment online when it's Elon Musk that's tweeting. He doesn't love your First Amendment so much when you and all your friends hold signs outside in a public park. Yeah. Also, I agree, Lynn Stacks. What does, what does this have to do with DEI? Like... <laughs> It was a was I, I haven't read Tanahasi Coates's article in a while, but I don't remember him making the case for oh you know how we should get reparations DEI. I don't think that was part of his like you know plan that he outlined or whatever. No, and what's <laughs> absolutely crazy is that he's Sagar is going to talk about how oh talking about how race is the biggest issue in American life. It's the economics. It's kitchen table issues. Yeah, well if you bother to read the case for reparations, he talks about why that is fundamental to fixing American society that the fabric of the American society is built on theft. Okay? Reparations are not a handout. It is a debt owed. It is a reflection on American history saying, yeah, we exploited and extracted specifically from the black population at a degree that was exponential compared to the extraction we did on basically every other marginalized group in this country, right? And that we need to fix that. That if you look back 60 years ago, guys. Stop, stop radicalizing all the white girls in our chat. I know, right? <laughs> Chill. Uh, well, yeah, draw, hit my line, radicalized white girls. I'm, I'm here to keep talking. I got tweet elbow pads and everything you know what i'm talking about ladies uh um, anyway it's like i don't know i don't know we can keep watching you can't talk his, about history and facts there's many provocations i mean i just think that to like lay the blame at the feet of one person is sort of insane Coase's case for reparations again is what radicalized a bunch of white liberals into I'm convinced he hasn't even read it. Thinking that burning the country down because a single cop murdered George Floyd was a good idea. Or for every A single cop murdered George Doesn't... Floyd, Gavin. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't he, he sound like start... he's about to cry, too? <laughs> I keep getting that vibe. His, like, his voice is getting all shaky. He wasn't prepared to have to debate. He didn't know. He could. He thought he could just get away with slandering Don Hussey Coates like that, saying that it, he's responsible for racism or whatever. Like, what? <laughs> Quoting Martin Luther King and this all of bullshit about like the riot is the voice of the unheard. All of that stems from him. That's and his crazy. case for That is crazy. I'm not the only person who's thinking. That is this. crazy to lay I'm not the, the only one Okay, that again. Everybody yeah. thinks it. You think it? I think everybody thinks it. <laughs> yeah, he's like the he he quotes Martin Luther King. The riots are the language of the unheard, and then says that came from Ta-Nehisi Coates. I'm pretty sure that quote was uttered before Ta-Nehisi Coates was probably alive. Um, oh, definitely, course, yeah. I, I don't know how old Tana Kazi is. Like, he's like my dad's age, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> Either way, I'm like, I don't think that's actually where that came from, Sagar. I'm pretty sure that came from someone else. <laughs> oh, god, it, it is just absurd. And guys. I really encourage everyone, if you read one piece from ta Coates, read The Case for Reparations, and then read, if you want to read one of his books, read Between the World and Me. It, it's powerful stuff. But you will see how he draws a very thorough line between all of the pernicious activities of banks and the United States government, and he takes a particular look at black homeownership and how uh, black individuals paid off what would have been a regular mortgage multiple times over, but then they weren't gaining proper equity in their homes because of scams, because of all kinds of things. And you also have to deal with like redlining, you have racial covenants to deal with building 
generational home ownerships who not only were all, with all the wealth stolen and extracted from them during the time of chattel slavery, not only was reconstruction totally thwarted, and then you had decades of Jim Crow afterwards. Okay. And then on top of that, finally they're free. And then the bank's going to steal all of the capital that they generate. So that's why you don't have generational wealth, particularly in black communities, right? Uh, they went ahead and got everybody else's homes in 2008, but you can read this through line. It's actually an expertly articulated and well-argued piece. And for him to slander it and to dismiss this one, I'm not sure you've even read it Two, If you read it, it was years ago and you're dumb cooked brain couldn't understand it couldn't unpack it because it wasn't chewed up and fed to you by tucker carlson or something but i mean i'm getting triggered right here i'm yeah. this is an absolute insane characterization of this text i also don't even really understand what his issue is with the piece he keeps making these vague references like oh it radicalized people or whatever but like is he wrong like what about his piece is incorrect sagar that's what i want to know because it's like i mean what you just outlined that he talks about in that piece is undeniable it's a matter of historical fact you can't argue with it you can't say that it's cherry picking no that's the history of this freaking country uh sorry if it makes you uncomfortable but that's the way it is so is this problem that ta Coast acknowledged historical fact is that the problem or is the problem that he then brought up reparations as an idea to try to you know progress things moving forward like because you can't argue with the historical fact but he doesn't actually say that he has an issue with the concept of reparations either i'm sure that he does but like is that his issue is his issue that ta coast wants to address this problem that is undeniable because i don't see how you could write a whole essay about a problem that's undeniable and then have a problem with someone proposing a solution to that issue <laughs> He's allowed to hold his political yeah, positions sure. that he has, and he's allowed to make, you know, a case in the okay. Atlantic magazine or wherever, or whatever he wants I didn't to say make. He shouldn't. He so shouldn't. To make reason. him more of a villain than a police officer that murdered someone for doing nothing um, is, to me, wild. But anyway, let's go ahead and move on to the rest of this interview, because this is also quite extraordinary, mm -hmm. because that was just the beginning. The opening question is basically, aren't you a terrorist? for thinking this. We've watched most of the spicy things. I really just wanted to give a lecture on why Sagar was completely <laughs> wrong in his characterization of ta Coates. And the other thing is, guys, look, there are very valid things to criticize ta Coates for, especially pre this evolution. But right now, when you're watching a guy take a tremendous stand, a stand for justice, you have his back. This guy's risking his whole career, everything that he's built. This guy, uh, against all odds, became one of the, I think actually the single most popular columnist that the Atlantic has had in my entire lifetime. Dude, this guy was driving insane numbers to that platform. He left it all behind. He wrote the fiction novel, right? I never actually got in. I never checked that one out, guys. I'll be real. I didn't read any of his fiction work. But He also was going to write that Black Superman script that never happened. I don't know yeah. if you heard about that. But. Yeah, he, he retreated from public life for a while after he got absolutely... Uh, you know, folded into a pretzel by Cornell West for not addressing the fact that Obama had some dog shit policy in Africa and in Syria and was, you know, uh, not exactly the perfect guy that ta Coates often portrayed him to be. But my my beef with what Sagar was saying is that you, you can't disrespect one of the great living American writers like that and not have the, anything of substance to add other than to blame him for a bunch of shit that's objectively not his fault and also to mischaracterize his argument, which is very well substantiated it's so well substantiated that it made the entire liberal american class be like holy shit you have a point we do owe black people a ton of money because the ancestors of american slaves have been pillaged over and over and over again and they have had their you know generational wealth vacuumed away from them by predatory individuals throughout the history of this country yeah you have to reckon with that because he argues it so goddamn perfectly otherwise they would have dismissed him otherwise he would have been kicked out of the liberal class long ago he's been able to perfectly thread the needle and we need people like that you can't dismiss people like that it's also like if if america took ta Coast's advice and actually gave reparations to black people i actually think it would help create the society that sagar fetishizes that he wants right this like post-race society or whatever obviously it's you know impossible we're never truly going to live in a post-racial society but i think a lot of people that advocate for reparations a big part of the point is not it's not just like oh i'm a black guy i wouldn't it be great if i got a bunch of money in my bank account like obviously that's not what it's about it's about repairing this inequality which continues to exist as a relic of the jim crow south and of slavery and of oppression as long as that exists yeah there is going to be racial tension in this country. It's a fact. It's undeniable. It's never going to go away. So the only way to move beyond that is doing what ta Coates recommended, which is repair the uh, 
you know, repair that to the greatest degree you can, which at this date and time is via reparations. It's not complicated. <laughs>